Hello, and welcome to CDA TV. This is Real Lives Live, and we've got another guest today. And I've known her personally for a long time, and she's just brilliant, and I love listening to her stories. And so she's going to be talking about her transgender journey. And it's been absolutely incredible. And hopefully it should be really empowering for anybody watching. And she will soon be releasing a book, which I can't wait to read. So we'll get on with it now because we only have one and a half hours. But we've also got the opportunity at the end for you to call in with any questions or anything you'd like to say to Samantha. So you can click on the link in the comments and you can join by Zoom. But now I'd like to introduce you to Samantha Pearsall. So hello, Samantha. Hello. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Oh, me too. I Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, well, I'm very excited. Oh, we could just have a chat. I mean, it's been fabulous, especially meeting other people from the LGBT plus community. So tell us a bit about yourself. So I was born as Richard, but I had a nickname, which was Dick. So obviously my sign name at that time probably wasn't appropriate. That was this. Um, but after a while, um, I changed to Samantha. So obviously this is my sign name now. So Samantha, how did you get that um, sign name? Well, it was from Manchester. I had a group of friends. And we went out to Cambridge and we were just out drinking and enjoying ourselves. We were at the bar and we were trying to figure out what was going on. But we were really, you know, we were partying and it was such a good scene. But I couldn't quite hear what was being said and I couldn't understand what the bartender was saying. And so I kept flicking my hair out of the way to hear. So that sort of became my sign name. Oh, brilliant. That's like mine. This is Daryl. But thank you that was just brilliant so obviously we've got a few photos to share today as well so we'll have a look at the first photo here it is do you remember that time how old were you then i think i was about eight yeah eight or nine but obviously the, at that time was when i was a boy and i had a really good memory of that time when that photo was taken but yeah I was eight or nine and I was a happy little boy at that stage yeah I was gonna say you look really happy and of course you had that little spike of your hair so was that your sign name at that time yeah that was that was my rude sign name obviously because my name was shortened to dick so that was my sign name it was given to me at school by the other people and obviously I never liked it and it never felt appropriate and obviously now Samantha is much better to sign like this. Oh, I can understand why. Absolutely. So do you think at that time, you know, inside, did you know that you didn't feel like a boy or? I think at that time I felt different. Definitely. Um, but at that time, the photo was taken. I was happy as a boy, but. I had two older brothers as well and I was quite younger. My brothers were quite tough and masculine and I just didn't feel like them at all. I felt more vulnerable and just completely different really. And I was very, very close to my mum and my brothers were sort of out doing wrestling and football and I just thought, oh no, I can't cope with that. And I was much more interested in women's things. And so I just sort of knew I was different and it was when my parents took us to Toys R Us as well when I was young you know we could go around and choose the toys whatever we wanted <clears throat> and I was completely obsessed with the like the model dolls like Barbies and I just said I really want that I, you know it was absolutely amazing to me and obviously my two brothers both went to G.I. Joe like the action men and my two brothers looked at me so strangely at w what I'd chosen. And I remember sort of saying, oh, that's not really suitable. That's for 
girls that's a girl's toy but I was so stubborn and I sat on the floor and I wouldn't move and I sort of threw a tantrum and my dad wasn't really sure what to do and I was so determined that I really wanted that toy um so you know that's one of the examples that I just knew I was a bit different and obviously I was Richard at that time so yeah I luckily I got the toy and I got to take it home and were you really happy with that then when you went home Yes, I mean, I was really, really happy, but I wasn't allowed to take it to school at that time. And my dad was really, really worried about that. And he didn't want me bullied because of it. And he said, OK, well, you can have the toy and you can take it home, but you're not allowed to take it to school because people might bully you. And I was really, really upset. and I felt really emotional about that. And I thought, oh, my two brothers can take their toys to school. Why can't I? And again, it was just another example of me being different. But I didn't really understand at that time because I was I was still really young. But obviously, looking back, they were just trying to protect me. Yeah, I mean, obviously now I think it's easy. You know, you can kind of recognise those differences. But, yeah. I think once or twice I, I sort of hid it in my bag and took it to school with me. But, um, yeah, I was, I was really proud of that. I felt like I'd won, really. Oh, so at, at that time, was that when you sort of started to feel a bit confused or did you already have that feeling no I mean I think it started before then <coughs> when I was about six um, and it was when I was by myself in the bathroom was really the only place that I could kind of escape by myself without my family judging me um, and so when I got out and you could wrap your towel around your chest and obviously men usually wrap it around their waist but ever since I was very very little I've always wrapped it around my chest and I had my towel wrapped around my head as well. So, you know, it was even sort of strange at that time. It felt like a woman in, when I was in the bathroom. And so, you know, I still sort of wrapped the towel around my chest. And other people might think that was weird. And they thought I was maybe body conscious at that time. But, yeah. So do you feel like your parents recognised that? earlier maybe at the same time you did or did that come later well my mum said to me you know when I was younger sort of would ask me if I was gay I think when I was about 14 or 15 and I became really angry but they'd never asked me before that so it was when I was about 14 or 15 and they were very supportive and they said you know please tell me if you are gay and I said no, no no I'm not I'm not gay and I became quite defensive about that really oh wow so obviously some children when they're at school age um one of the big differences obviously you know they might split the boys and the girls for sports and the girls changing rooms and the boys just changing rooms so how did you feel about that i remember when i was in the boys changing rooms it felt a bit like scary really i mean it felt like i was sort of forced to change in front of all the boys and i just hated it so I went to like, hide in the corner and did it very privately to get changed and I was always one of the very first out of the changing rooms because I really didn't like it wow that must have been quite emotional for you yeah definitely it was so from now if you're looking back and comparing it to now how do you feel that confusion has you know been resolved really well, I think really from when I was sort of between six and eight, I didn't really understand what transgender was. I didn't have any understanding of that. Nobody had taught me that, you know, you can change gender. I just thought I'm always going to struggle. I knew I was different, but I didn't know what was going on. I just really struggled with that. So I thought maybe, you know, that parents might see that I'm struggling and they referred me to the M mermaid charity um which is a lot of support for parents who have children who are transgender so it's been set up for a while now oh wow so did your parents know that that was there no i think they didn't know anything at that time but obviously now um i wish that they had known about it back then so that they'd have support and much earlier on oh wow so that's a quite a big difference obviously not having that support back then but we see a lot nowadays on social media 
where you know from very early ages that parents are quite supportive of children wanting to be a, the different gender from when they were born so allowing them that change and so I feel like it is slowly getting through to society do you feel the same yeah I mean definitely when parents are there for their children and letting them express themselves and not leaving them to deal with it you know and giving them those options rather than saying you know you can't do this you can't do that or I think you should do that you're already telling them that their ideas are wrong so it means that they're less likely to share that with you you know they're never going to become their true self and move on from that mental health it's very difficult if you're not going to deal with it you know and that can that can be passed on really easily so it's interesting to see but just you know to, to leave them to whatever they feel suits them and it's interesting isn't it because sometimes you'll see some parents and sort of say maybe they're defensive about it and they're thinking oh you know yeah my son's tough and maybe they don't realize the impact that that's having on their son is that right can we show them the next photo so what what's going on there so that picture was when i had my hair transplant and i was in um i was ill mentally and so i was in manchester in the center and it was the company called Fargo, Fargo. And that's based in Manchester and they do hair transplants. And I just remember at that time, my hair had started to recede and it massively affected my mental health. I just didn't feel happy. I was really, really struggling. And back at that time, you know, I had to get through that. You know, I wanted really beautiful hair. And my mum always said, you know, one day you will have long hair. You know, one day you'll get there. And I just couldn't imagine how it felt completely impossible. Like, I'd never get my hair back. And so when I arrived at Fargo, it was brilliant because they sort of found me a hair transplant. And I booked it and I didn't care about the price or anything. I was just, I had to go for it. And really, that was life-changing. It really helped my mental health as well. So how did they do that transplant at that time? So they gave you, I don't know whether it was like a sedative or something, but it makes you sort of drowsy for 12 hours. And they take off all of your hair and they shave it all at the back, around here. And they have a sort of strip that they put off and then you get a lot of nurses who very 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 carefully take pieces off and sew the pieces in and so I had to sit and watch um, a film in front of me and so that sort of distracted me because it's quite a long film so I could watch that all the way through and the nurses were in the back like attaching the hair to my head and I was watching the film so I didn't feel a thing so that was for 12 hours that took yeah wow amazing and so yeah at half past seven at night it was finished so after that did it feel much better yes I mean it was a bit sore but it was bearable definitely and am I right at that time that was the first process for you through the transgender stage is that right Oh no, that was the second. Okay, so what was the first then? So I had um, my genitals obviously removed and changed. So that was my first operation, my first surgery. Okay, so can we just go back a little bit then? So obviously we're talking about that first stage of removing your male genitalia. Did you feel really nervous about that? I mean, what was going through your head at that time? So when you, do you remember it clearly on that day? Oh yes, I remember it so clearly. I mean, perfectly clear. So, were you excited or? So yeah, I was traveling to Hammersmith and arrived at King's Cross. So I had to arrive the night before and I had my ex-partner with me and with my mum. So we went down to London and we were in the Hammersmith area 
and we had to sort of go and check in with the nurses and the nurse sort of said I'm not allowed to eat for 12 hours beforehand I think it was and I think it's like fasting before an operation so I couldn't eat for a certain amount of time before that <laughs> but I was so determined I wanted food I was starving oh so did you go to McDonald's right but they said you know if you eat you can't have surgery tomorrow and I was just oh, completely dreaming of pizza it was across the road you know it was like felt like it was waving at me I really wanted the pizza and the nurse said okay well you can have one slice of pizza that's it and so finally I went and I got my one slice of pizza and after eating it we went to bed um, and my partner and mum went off and left me in the hospital on the ward um, and there were three beds and then three beds opposite as well so six in total are they, were they all the same, all going through the same surgery? Yes. I mean, we all had this, we were all in the same ward, which was the Marjorie ward. So there were six of us in total. And it felt really, really strange because I kept looking at what the time was. And I knew it was sort of coming closer and I was the first person in the morning to go because, and I was hoping for the interpreter to arrive as well. And I was hoping that my partner would arrive at that time and my mum hadn't arrived, my partner hadn't arrived and time was ticking and the nurse was sort of telling me the surgery's today, um, you know, we need to get going. And I kept sort of thinking about excuses like maybe I need to go to the toilet and she said, oh no, you know, you need to have the operation. And I said, no, no, no I need to see my partner, I need to see my mum before going. And then of course, what happened? Oh, because I was really worried that, you know, I might never wake up after or during the surgery. I might never wake up. So you never know what's going to happen. So I just really, really, really wanted to see my mum. So that I could say goodbye when I went into the surgery. So luckily she came in time and said goodbye as I went to sleep. So then after that. You had your first surgery and then you went on to your second surgery, which was the hair transplant. What else have you had done? I've had breast augmentation and then I had my teeth done and then I had lip filler and um, Botox in my bottom as well. Oh my goodness, you had so much done to you. Wow. So you had the hair transplant. How old were you at that time? I'm trying to think. It was such a long time ago. I thinking that was in 2006, I think, about 2006. Yeah, so quite a while ago. I think we've got a photo of that, haven't we? Uh, a 10 year difference. If we can have a look at those photos and compare them from the beginning of the transition to afterwards. There we go. So that was at the age of 16 on the left, in 2016, and then all done at the end. My goodness, what a difference. Can you tell me back to, take me back to how your mind was at that time? Can you remember? Well, at that time I was still a boy. I was just starting the transition phase and just felt not happy with myself. I was feeling depressed really because I was struggling with my identity and at that time I had come out to my parents and I remember telling them I'm not gay but actually I'm transgender and the shock they just weren't expecting it I think they were expecting me to come out rather than to be transgender and because I've got an older brother who is gay my worry was to have uh, you know the, I had my, my elder brother who was um, gay and then uh, he's called Philip and then Matthew is hearing, he's straight and then I'm the littlest to have a deaf transgender child as well. You know, what a difference in the family. And I didn't think that it would be like that, you know, to have gay, straight, trans, all in the three children. But at that time, you know, the education was so poor. My education was so poor. Um, I'm so grateful for the support that I got. Well, I've personally met your parents. I remember it's about four years ago. 
and I was so shocked at how beautiful they were and jealous at how beautifully they signed with you all. And it's natural, of course, for parents to want the best for their children, so I guess it was a worrying time for them. I think my mum felt the emotions more than my dad did. My dad, he's quite laid back as a person. And, uh, yeah, I think although he did find it difficult with my transition, my mum was worse emotionally. I think she had to go through a, a grieving process because there was no support from my parents at that time. And that's so important to get that, isn't it? Yeah, there's no support for parents out there who are dealing with their child coming out and being transgender. So I kind of feel like it's difficult to, to It's difficult to get the support from people because a lot of people feel rejected by their parents. And my mum didn't do that to me. She was just going through the grieving process because I was going from Richard to Samantha and she had to grieve for Richard because he had then gone. And that was an emotional time for her. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm getting goose pimples. Yeah, that was really hard for my mum. At that time, I didn't understand. I was like, oh, come on, mum, you can get over it. This is who I am. Move on, get over it. But my mum was explaining to me that it is a grieving process and I'm struggling to understand because I'm going through the change as much as you are. I'm having to transition with my emotions of, of who you are and your identity as much as you are. And when I look back, I can understand that. Maybe I was a little bit hard on them. But if I empathise with them a bit more, I can understand the grieving process because there was no support for them, absolutely nothing. And that's vital, isn't it? And if anybody else here is, is going through a change, to involve the parents and to get support for them as well. I never thought about that myself. So if I was to have a son who was to pass away and then to then have a girl in their place, that's kind of what it's like. Yes, it is. And for a brief time, they couldn't deal with watching Richard change to be Samantha, saying goodbye to Richard. Oh, I was just getting on with my day-to-day -day work. Mum had to go to work. She had to just get on with everything. And it affected my mum because she's a performer. But, yeah, I d I had to, she had to become more open about my son is Samantha now even though it was a really hard time. They had counselling, thankfully, and I invited them in as part of my counselling. Their work gave them counselling, and that's a real tip that I will give to anybody out there, is if your child is going through the transition, the best way of coping with it is to see your child as a twin. Oh, okay, that's a really good tip, yeah. So now mum sees Richard and Samantha as twins. And then after that, she felt a lot better about it. Oh, that's such a nice way of looking at it. I know my mum, she'll always shout, you know, Daryl, dinner's ready. Uh, and I can imagine for your mum that was quite difficult to, to learn to change your name from Richard to Samantha. Well, it's kind of my fault because it's naturally part of my personality to be mischievous. Always. Oh, why am I not surprised about that at all? I am a little bit mischievous and I like to wind up my mum uh, because I have a, such a beautiful relationship with her we're able to wind each other up and she'd always go to say Richard and then go oh I mean Samantha and it took her quite a while to get used to that so at the end she just got used to saying it I, I'm not supposed to say it live but um Samantha is, is the, the sign name that she has given me. Oh, the password on the computer is now Samantha to help her to remember it. Oh my gosh, you give me so many tips so, so far. And my dad as well, yeah. He finds that if he's typing Samantha again and again on the computer, it kind of just rolls off the tongue easier. What made you pick the name Samantha? What was your reason for that? Well, as I was going through the transition, 
from stopping being Richard, I said to my parents, if I had been born a girl, what would my name have been? And my mum said, it would definitely be Samantha Jane. I was like, okay, well, that's what my name should be then, Samantha Jane. And so that's how I've changed my name through the deep pole. It's now Samantha Jane. Because I feel like that's who I should have been born as. And also that helps me to bond with my parents, to ask them what name they would have chosen, rather than coming up with a name for myself. Um, because that would have been quite difficult for them to kind of empathise with, to understand. I felt that it was the, the nicest thing to do. Yeah, I agree. And uh, it's, it's interesting thinking about other transgender people, how they have come up with a name. Do you know? Oh, that's a really good question to ask, actually. And I would recommend that to anybody who's going through the transition to ask your parents what your name would have been. I think that's really sweet to ask, what would you have called me if I were a girl? And your parents must feel proud that they've got to name you anyway. Let's have a look at the next photo, shall we? That was my 30th birthday. Oh, I remember I was there. That was such a good time. So you've got your mum and your dad there. Oh, that's such a beautiful photo. I remember it so clearly. It really wasn't that long ago. It was only three, four years ago. Well, next week will be my birthday on the 26th. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it was that long ago. Time goes by so fast, isn't it? And you were fully transgender then? You were official or had you not quite finished? Oh gosh, I can't remember. I'm trying to think. That's a really good <coughs> question. I never thought about it. I just kind of got on with those aspects of my life. I think 2014 was when um, I had the, the genital change and, and that was when I had the cosmetic surgery. That was when I kind of felt like I'd, I'd made the full change, which was about two years ago. So the whole change all together is a 10 year process, isn't it? Gosh, what a journey you've been on. It's a long journey and it's also not a cheap journey. It's been ever so expensive. So yes, it is difficult and you have to get the money to pay for the surgery. You know, it's not free on the NHS. The genital reassignment surgery was um, on the NHS, but that was the only part of it that was free. That was it. So my breasts, my hair, my teeth, my bottom, everything else had to be paid for um, what they call the cosmetic surgery. Yeah, I guess it's, it's what not an essential surgery. I'm trying to remember when I've, I've met somebody else who was going through the transition, uh, through the transgender change, and they were going through the NHS, but they had to go through, I'm thinking, about five years of counselling first before they could get started on the process of the, the operational procedures. Um, do you advise that to have counselling first? Yes, I would recommend that, absolutely, to have counselling. I didn't have counselling personally, and I think the reason for that was um, when you go for your first appointment, I went to London, um, uh, Brighton, Manchester, all different places, and it was London that I finally chose. And um, the questions were things like, have you experienced abuse? Are you a drug user um, and I think that was um, kind of instead of me going to counselling I think they looked at that and thought actually you don't need to go for counselling because I was quite a straightforward case I guess. Um, I think looking back though I would benefit from counselling but there just wasn't the opportunity it's been a, such a struggle through this whole journey and if I look back if I could change one thing it would be to have had counselling But they didn't provide it. I guess they didn't even think to ask, did they? No, they didn't. They didn't. They just thought you're going to be a straightforward case. Um, there's no issues on the, the tick boxes that I've got here. So let's go ahead with the procedures. And I met a few doctors every three months or so to get blood tests and checks. And then they sent me off for the procedure. 
there were questions that went with it, like why are you transitioning? Um, and I had two psychiatrists as well assess my mental health. Um, but yeah, they s deemed me as okay, so off I went for the surgery. If we're generally talking about people who, um, just anybody, I would always advise counselling. And do you think you'd have to go um, through the GP or is it something you had to do privately? Well, for a deaf person in the deaf community, there are barriers to communication already and to counselling as well. There's um, Sign Health or Deaf for Deaf, um, but um, through the CCG, the uh, care commissioning group, you can actually, um, you have to appeal because they have no idea what, what it is, what deaf counselling is. But there are the services out there, but it's something that you have to really fight for um, because most GPs are hearing, all GPs are hearing as far as I'm aware, and so you have to, they think you just need an interpreter with you as you do for a doctor's appointment. So it's not the same because you get passed from pillar to post and have that three-way conversation. Okay, so if you were to train GPs on how to empathise with a transgender person who was deaf, is there anything out there? Is there any training for anybody who's deaf? on how to cope with transgender and the transition. No, there isn't. There's nothing out there. And I think that, that uh, for deaf people to have that empathy and that full understanding, there are deaf counsellors out there, yes, but there's none who can really understand my journey. They can't sort of take a walk in my shoes and see what I've been through. Well, goodness. Well, hopefully we'll have a few people out there who will um, be able to be transgender and train as a trans uh, counsellor, that would be fantastic. Well, let's have a look at another photo. Who's this? That's me. Was that just at the start of your process? I moved to Manchester in 2008. And at that time, I felt like I was becoming myself. I felt like I didn't have to answer to my family of who it is that I am. Oh, I totally get that. When you get out to university, you're like, oh, forget the family, I'm free now. I totally get that. And in the northeast of England, in Middlesbrough, where I'm from, that area is quite a rough area and it's quite a, a place of poverty to live and um, there was very little LGBT education at that time and so I felt that if I continued to live there I would probably experience a lot of bullying and I wouldn't be happy with my life so the only way really was to escape and my escape was Manchester. I have a sign for Manchester in the LGBT community we sign Manchester which I think is hilarious, <laughs> I have to let you know. Oh yeah, I love that sign. And the reason for it, I asked a, a gay friend of mine, I said, why do you sign that? And they say, oh, there's so many handsome men and women in the LGBT community in Manchester that it makes you dribble and salivate <coughs> with how delicious they look. So that's why we sign Manchester. So why did you move to Manchester? Well, that photo was in 2008 and I lived with my best friend in Manchester and I work, she worked in mental health in a mental health hospital. And that was 2008, that was my first job role as a support worker in a, a mental health support unit in, within a hospital. That was my first job and I loved working with various patients there were so many challenges that went with it and at the same time I was supporting patients I was transitioning myself so although I was supporting people with mental health my mental health wasn't fantastic at the time which as you can imagine was a real challenge and I'm still working now in that general field um, working with challenging behavior people with learning disabilities someone who've got their criminal background and um, that's something that I've been doing it's my passion and that's something that I want to do for a long time. But that's really useful and it's very sort of 
um, great to have those tips for other people who maybe are struggling with the thoughts that they're having. But yes, I mean, definitely when I went out in Manchester with some of my best friends, um, I was just thrilled to sort of go out to university and go partying with them all. <coughs> and there was like a Manchester gay village out there that we used to celebrate in. So when you went back to Middlesbrough, did you feel like really proud that you'd managed to sort of leave and then when you came back, completely different? Yeah, I mean, when I came back, obviously I came back as a woman, so my parents um, were sort of very shocked and they had to sort of deal with that. It's like um, when you go away on holiday for a long time and come back and people think you've changed and, you know, every time I went back I changed a little bit more and changed a little bit more. Oh, it's like seeing sort of a photo change, isn't it, through the years? Yeah, I mean, my parents would struggle because maybe they haven't seen me three or four weeks and my hair would be getting longer. Maybe I'd have my, ma my nails done or something. So I think for them, it felt really, really fast. But for me, it seemed to take forever. It was so slow. And obviously, my parents would sort of see me and they'd think, oh, slow down. It's You're changing really quickly. And I'd sort of say, well, really, I haven't seen you in six weeks. You know, it's quite a long time. So obviously one thing that I'm thinking of is, do you remember like when you were going through the um, transition, what about, you know, the hormones that you have to take through treatment? What's your advice to anybody else going through the change? You know, are there, you know, official hormones that you have to take or? Yeah, I mean, going back at that time, there was lots of people who aren't happy with the waiting time. So for me, from the first referral to the GP to seeing a specialist in London was about 18 months, nearly two years. But obviously now with coronavirus, it could be even longer. It could be sort of three or four years. But I know that a lot of trans people online are buying hormones. Honestly, it can be a bit dangerous because you should be having blood tests first to check your blood levels, making sure that everything's okay and matching the hormones to them. When you're buying them online, I know, you know, I can understand people want them now, they don't want to wait. I completely understand that. Yeah, I think, you know, that makes sense, you know, when people are not wanting to wait and they want to order their hormones online. But with those blood tests, if they're not having them, what could happen? Like, what are the effects that could happen so really I just know that some of the risks of taking the hormones treatment without having blood tests things like heart attacks and I'm and blood clots so if I'm flying abroad for more than four hours I have to wear special socks because it the risk of having blood clots is higher so I think things like that it could be linked to and so I remember sort of meeting other people that have had hormones and it affects their moods. Maybe they have mood swings up and down and feeling confused. Did that happen to you? Yeah, I mean, when I started taking hormones, I had estrogen. And there's lots of different names of different hormones, but I was on estrogen. And when I first started taking them, I just remember, you know, my breasts were really painful it felt like golf balls really they were really hard and it's like someone had sort of elbowed you if they even if they just tapped you you know it felt really really hard it felt like they were like bursting out of my chest really I mean yeah that was very very painful on those hormones right at the beginning and obviously a bit later on it started to affect my mood and I was having awful mood swings and I think you know I snapped my parents quite a few times during that period because my your body at that time So yeah, I think there's a lot of sort of labels out there and a lot of trans people who are, you know, maybe not having hormone replacement or maybe they're experiencing domestic abuse. They've got like a lot of effects, all these other things going on as well. And, you know, obviously there's lots of things that could make people emotional or become angry. You know, they might be struggling or other people might be struggling with their life child. Uh, their lifestyle and it could be that people are rejecting them as well as in their life 
And it's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously they might sort of give that impression, but you don't know what's going on. It's very unfair for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, you know, there might be loads of people out there who aren't experiencing that love, that acceptance. So, you know, yeah, it's very, very difficult for some. And obviously, you know, there's lots of different people not sort of just talk about transgender, but, you know, they might be sort of going through the process and, you know, you've just got to encourage people, you know, give them space. They're not, you know, they're not just cross for no reason. They're going through the transition stage. So as part of the sort of society, like social um, view, do you have sort of like memberships of different societies, things? Well, I think at that time, um, there was me and one other transgender person I was friends with. And I was trying to think of my allies. And I thought, really, it's just me and that person. It, you know, it was just us being able to talk to each other. It, you know, we sort of say, oh, who else? And we always used to say, you know, there must be other others out there. There must be. But it, it was so difficult to imagine at that time. So I've actually set up a Facebook page called Deaf Transgender World. And that was back in 2018. So it was just us two. And we started to invite some other gay friends who maybe knew other transgender people who would join. And then we'd be able to talk to each other and make various different connections about who we knew. And it suddenly became like a very big community. I think there's about 841 members now. So I think about 300 or 400 are deaf transgender. And that's throughout the world now, which is brilliant. Wow, I mean, that's much higher than I expected. So deaf and transgender. I thought maybe that was like, you know, 40, 45. But to say, wow, that's, you know, 800. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it might be, you know, men who want to become women or women who want to become men. You know, it says transgender at the top, but really it's sort of like an umbrella term for any people who are struggling with their gender identity. So, I mean, really, there's so many different identities out there. So <coughs> I'm not going to try and name them all, so don't ask me because I'd never remember. I don't even think we've got time. You know, we go on and on and on. We've only got an hour. I think... You know, most people sort of say 38 different identities wow. and some people say there's up to 70. So, wow. So at that time, that kind of basic, you know, set up for people to join, if they're sort of having difficulties with stress or maybe they're facing a lot of barriers in the deaf world, is that why you set that up? Yeah, I mean, partly. I just felt there was a sort of responsibility. I felt very, very privileged because we live in England. We've got law in place to protect to protect transgender people and i think i can so empathize with other people in different parts of the world who don't have that law they don't have that protection and you know i really wonder how deaf people in that community feel as well in different countries but a lot of people don't see that they take the nhs for granted really they don't see how lucky they are and if you compare to other countries with you know other people don't have the nhs and so you know, I wonder how other people are getting through that journey without that support. So I feel like a little bit responsible, really, for the transgender community have given me the nickname, like Mother Hen, you know, so I'm looking out for people. And I think sometimes, you know, I feel like I'm a little bit exhausted, feel like, you know, it's so difficult. But having that community there, we use international sign, we can communicate, help each other. And really, that's basic counselling there. Because there's no, you know, other counselling in different places in the world. So that is that provision right there. So obviously, you know, other countries not having that recognition for transgender or, you know, maybe in America they might have some sort of advances. But do you feel like there's, you wanted to sort of project that support around the world? Is that right? So how can we support these people through that process if there's not that law in place? <coughs> could you just explain that what what do you mean so so for example if you're in other countries maybe they don't recognize transgender people but they want to go through the process how do you so for example like with passports do they get recognized things like that that's a really good question so obviously here in 
England we have um, passports so we can sort of protect ourselves so that you can change your name and that's all fine but in other countries in the world you can't change your name on your passport so there's one um, in the transgender group that I set up and you know there's people all over the world in that but I've not actually met with them face to face so it would be lovely to meet some of them and have you know find some of their difficulties some of them you know they can't change their name on their passport maybe their appearance has changed but it means they can't fly out anywhere because they look different to their passport and it might also be that their you know their language barrier as well if they don't have people to help them so having that connection outside the country is really important oh wow that must be really difficult like feeling completely helpless yeah i mean i've had definitely one or few one or two like a few people messaging me saying you know please help i need to get out i need to see my family or you know and i really struggle with that because i have to remind myself you know it's not possible to help everybody um so hopefully you know i've sort of decided i'd write a book and hopefully through that i can get out to more people and help to provide a little bit of support but obviously it is in English but I'm hoping that maybe we could get that translated and on the book at the back we've got a QR code so it could be that somebody could scan it and translate it in sign language I mean that's my dream really that's ideal so when is that book launching uh, it's in July yeah the end of July it will be out It should have been um, in last October, but obviously because of coronavirus, everything's been delayed. So, wow. So, I mean, how many languages do you think the trans the book will be translated into? So, it's in English. Obviously, that's the first language. And then hopefully it will be launched through the Commonwealth, so into different languages there. And then I that will be about 25 languages. But I'd love to translate it more, but obviously that's a lot of a lot of effort but we're going to try and get it translated as much as possible wow so that's not only going out in britain but for the rest of the world as well that's fantastic yeah and i mean in bsl but also in international sign language so i'm looking for people currently who can translate into international sign language so anybody who's watching if you're signing international make sure you're letting us know wow that's brilliant so let's have a look if we've got a call and uh, the next photo so what's happening there oh this photo yes i do remember this one um yeah that's we're all being the spice girls So what about the next photo that we've got? Have we got another photo? Oh, we always go to that gig. You know, I love it. And we can go out with a group of friends. Yeah, I've been to a fantastic one recently. Um, where Where was it? I can't remember. And one of the olympic performances um the performers were sort of opening the gig that i went to and i was so thrilled um i didn't go and say hello but she was right you know they were right there so anyway have we got the next photo we can have a look at so who's that that's my me and my new partner <laughs> so how long have you been together Oh, we've been together one year in June, so we met um, just as I started, as I finished writing the book. I'd spent three years and I'd gone through all the journey and I'd accomplished that. So, I mean, the book was a lot about my struggles, you know, the struggles with being a man and struggles with men as well. And I closed the book and I thought, right, that's, that's it, that's finished. And we did some editing and there was like 15 things that were like throwaway lines about emotional you know or I'd stopped myself because I felt like I couldn't write anymore because I'd become too emotional 
and the editor said well no you need to expand on that actually so I had to keep expanding and then by the end of it I'd finished and I felt like wow that you know that's it I've closed the book on that it was very literal for me so the book itself how did you start writing that how you know tell us about that I think it started a lot of the deaf community were getting in touch and sort of asking about my story and if we go back again a little bit further we'll go back to the start the deaf community have been lovely you know lots are very very interested in my story and you know changing the name and I felt like I was telling my story a lot it felt very repetitive if I'm honest you know you'd sign it once and then the crowd would grow and you'd have to repeat certain bits and it felt, you know, sometimes I couldn't be bothered to explain. It feels like a very long journey for me. And so the best way would just be put it in a book. There you go. It's all done. If you, if somebody wants to know my life story, where I've been, how the journey was, where I started and where it ended, it's right there. You know, and hopefully it'll be translated into BSL as well. And they can watch it and they can feel that connection in that way. You know, there's a lot of books out there, yes, but... Um, you know, there's sort of no novels or there's a little bit of fiction in it. But I really wanted something that somebody could really relate to. And, you know, for the audience to feel that is what it's actually like to go through that process. For them to feel the highs and the lows with me. So from the very start of putting pen to paper, how long was it then? Three years, yes, it was three years in total. Uh, I needed 15,000 words. And then with the editing, we added a few more bits and to it. So yes, it was 15 words to start with, but by the end it was 33,000 words because I'd left out all the emotional issues. So when you started to go through the process of letting everything out, that must've been really hard for you. It was. It was really emotional. There were lots of tears, lots of ups and downs that went with it. But my friends were very supportive, really proud of me, saying, you've got this, you can do this. But I was studying at university at the same time. I was editing and I was counselling and doing university all at the same time. It, it was a real juggling act. Having to go through it all again, I kind of think that's why I wish I'd had counselling at the start. So when you created the book, was that a realisation for you that you had needed counselling? Yeah, it was, because I felt so much better once I got it out and put it into the book to finally finalise what it is, to be completely raw with my feelings, to open the wounds that I had tried to close. And yeah, it was really upsetting to, to put it all there, but I'm so pleased that I did it. Oh gosh, that's really emotional. And to have your boyfriend supporting you as well through the process, that's so lovely to get through that part of the journey now. Some people do say when they've had counselling that you should put it down on paper. Yeah, and some counsellors say that as well, don't they, to keep a journal. What was the moment in the book that really impacted you? I think the main impact was uh, my acceptance of myself. That we all want to be accepted, we all want to be loved. So why is it so difficult? I think there's so much stigmatization out there of, you know, if I'm going to deaf events, you know, I can't guarantee necessarily that the people aren't gonna talk about me, you know, say that person over there, they're trans, and to have eyes on me. You know, I think if it was a hearing person, they wouldn't pick it up because it would be too far for them to, to hear it. But with a deaf person, you see it, you see it in signing and you can see that people are talking about you. But I'm luckily got a very thick skin, so I've got over it. I feel it must hurt, though, when you see people talking about you. You know, it's so sensitive because you are a human there's no need for them to talk to you about that well I don't understand why people need feel the need to do it that's what hurts the most that's what I find most difficult I'm sorry to hear that you've been through that 
Can you advise people in the audience of what to do and not do? Maybe that would help. Well, let's start with what you should do, I think. What you should do, the best thing is to just just say nothing negative. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, just um, leave people to themselves, to their own business. Because that can affect people. You can hurt people. So just keep your opinions to yourself. I think that's the best thing to do. Things to not do is to say, oh, she was a man, or she was this, or she was that. You know, the past is the past. You know, yeah, it's a case of dragging the past into the, the current, and that must be so repetitive for you and exhausting. Yeah, I think so, because the deaf community don't realise saying she was a man, she's transgender, is actually a hate crime. Some people in the community don't realise actually what a hate crime is, that we need more education on that. So a lot of deaf people often think, oh, sorry, oh, oh, I didn't mean it. Other thing is um, people saying, well, you don't look like a man. I never want to look like a man anyway, so why would you say that? But again, it's education. I don't believe it's their fault. I believe it's just a poor education and they need better education at school. That's where it's important to start these conversations. So obviously, sometimes it can be really difficult because, um, you know, to sort of stand up and say things like that, just to be blunt, you know, without hurting other people people you know you've got to think about them you've got to think about their feelings um so obviously that's really really difficult so if anything if anybody is calling through then obviously feel through i think it's useful for a straight man to understand that if you're with a trans woman that doesn't make you gay and that's really to really important to educate people on that yeah i agree i agree If you're looking at the flowers in a garden, it's beautiful to see different colours and variety of flowers, isn't it? And it's the same thing in the world. I think we might be ready for somebody to come through with a question. Do we have anybody ready? Oh, we will soon. Okay. Because we've had a few technical problems, um, that's, that's why we're having to delay that part of the the interview slightly if you do want to call in please do sorry about the technical issues uh, I don't know why it keeps happening unfortunately so let's think about where we were remind me what we were talking about oh I remember we we're talking about the book yes uh, important to educate men out there because we see a lot of men who uh, are committing suicide there's high levels of suicide and it's mostly due to peer pressure within the community people saying oh you like someone who's trans and actually we need to stop that because that mental health and that person is going to get worse and the suicide rates are high enough as it is so it's really important to get that out there to say you're not gay if, if you're if you fancy a trans woman she's, it's just a woman you know you're a man who's attracted to a woman that's it so if somebody was dating a trans person, I, th I think it's actually really remarkable. I think it's beautiful just to kind of, uh, I love the fact that, you know, everyone is beautiful no matter who you are. Yeah, it's the heart that's important. If your heart connects with someone else's heart, that's all that matters. Let's go back a little bit um, to before the book. What was it that inspired you to make the book in the first place, to write it? What was the, the influence? Was it the social media? Did you feel like there was something missing? What was it? I did feel that, yes, there was something missing, and that was the educational aspect. I wanted to educate people 
and I saw that as my responsibility, my natural responsibility to get the book out there because what I really want to do is help those who, you know, touch wood um, if somebody passes away that, that this is my legacy, you know, something that I can pass down and we can say, oh, who's Samantha? Oh, that was your great grandmother, you know, and this is, this is her journey. It's something really interesting to look at. When I was younger, I didn't have any role models. I didn't have anyone to look up to, any books that I could read. So I didn't know how I was going to achieve what I've achieved. Trans literature is out there, but it's mostly for hearing people. Is that right? Well, at the time when I was growing up, it wasn't really out there. When I see someone sign, um, you know, what trans means I feel like you're not going to see it nobody signed it to me because I was at school and at that time it, it just wasn't part of the education so that's what I see as really important so I'm going to sign it now this is the sign trans do you have any more signs that are relevant well we have a little bit of an issue we have trans like this which is transgender, and that's part of the uh, umbrella. But that means that the person has gone through the change. They've gone from a man to a woman, and that's it. That's the end of the journey. You know, changed and done. But actually, you need to look at the context. Like I said, there's 38 to 70 different trans translations or um, umbrella terminologies, depending on... Um, person's felt identity and so it's kind of it's it's uh, it's multiple terms and so just having the one to the other isn't enough it has to be all encompassing that's so interesting that you say it being all encompassing I completely agree the words that people use transgender what's not okay to sign or to say do you have any advice for anybody Lots of people um, don't like the word tranny. That's almost a mocking word, isn't it? Yes, saying someone's a tranny. That's something that trans people feel, you know, it's really not okay, it's not nice. Any others? People saying, oh, you don't look like trans, or oh, you look like a man, or you don't look like a man, or you know, commenting on my gender. That reminds me of something that's um, happened in the past. I've had people say to me, you don't look deaf. Well, what's the deaf person supposed to look like? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's insulting, isn't it? What about any others? Let's give some advice to the community. Hello. <coughs> oh, this is so interesting. Can you see me? Is everything ready? Yep, yep, we can see you. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> this has been so interesting. When I first met somebody who was transgender was in 1975 in America. I met a deaf transgender person in 1975. At that time, you know, we did have the different sign for it, the old fashioned sign, and that's a good point, which I really do understand. But 1975, that was, you know, they did have a, a group back then, and I wondered whether maybe you could get in contact with them. Oh, yeah, that would be brilliant. That, um, that person was a um, woman, uh, a lesbian woman before, and then transitioned to become a man, and is still with the same woman now, which is lovely. They've been together all this time, which is really interesting. But yes, when I was younger, there, yes, there are lots of trans people out there, but I think there's people who I know who are over 80 now, so who are older people in the, the transgender community. So I just wanted to share that with you. Oh, that's so lovely. Oh, I'd love to get in contact with that person. Yes, I'll absolutely give you their email address. Yeah, thank you so much. 
Okay, bye-bye. Wow, that was really interesting. I don't know one person who sort of got in touch and said they were sort of transgender. I think they were over 70 or something. I was really amazed. I think, it's, you know, it's coming up more and more now and it's surprising me, but I'm so pleased. I think it's about time really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, back at that time, I, I don't even know. I mean, even when I was younger, there was only two of us, I felt. So obviously that person right back then had it worse because there was so few. Yeah, and I mean, they would have had to stay completely closed off. It's so difficult. And obviously meeting other people in different generations. Have you got experience of that? Yeah, I think in, in London I met, it was, I mean, very sadly they've passed away now, but um, I've met one from an older generation, but yeah, that's it really. That's it. So obviously... With the internet now, obviously, you know, you're getting lots more opportunities. You can video call people, support each other. And obviously, I know you mentioned about having the sort of responsibility to provide that support to various different people. So, yeah, I mean, if anybody's got any issues, you can join us on a Facebook group. You can offload any problems. You can private inbox. But at the same time, you know, I can't answer everybody's issues. Sometimes I can't help. But we've got four admins in the group. There's one from England, as well as me. Um, there's one from America. Um, I think she's um, originally from Venezuela. And there's another person from Miami. And one from New Zealand. Which, yeah, I mean, it's brilliant. And that person's called... Yasmin, so yeah, there's four of us all together. So we'll try our best to answer when we can. Wow, I mean, hopefully that group will grow. I mean, already we're starting to see people coming out of the woodwork all over the place. And, you know, when people, you know, sort of come out or they sort of join the community, it's lovely to see. Because as you say, you know, in, in history, there's been very, very difficult for people to come out and they've had to sort of shut themselves off from society. So... Before you met Misha, how did you feel then? I mean, I thought I was the only one. I didn't, nobody taught me that I could transition and I didn't know about that, you know, because nobody taught me, so how would I? And so when somebody introduced me to Misha, that was my friend Laura. So she knew that person and she said, you know, oh, I know somebody else, I'll introduce you. And, you know, we just, we just clicked instantly it was like we're sisters so without Laura introducing me to Misha it wouldn't be the same you know I think that really opened my eyes to the rest of the community and that's so important isn't it having somebody there to inspire you and then that community just growing and obviously those passing on those connections is vital so just to let you know obviously if anybody wants to call in feel free you can ask questions so I'll just go back a little bit to um, when you were a boy at that time. You felt like you weren't a boy and you, you remember that clearly? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember looking and, you know, I looked in the mirror and I just sort of thought, I'm not a boy. You know, I had the towel wrapped all around my head. I had my towel wrapped up at my chest and I looked in the mirror and I just thought, I'm not a boy, but... And when I hit puberty, I really struggled. And when I had a shower, I would always like hide my genitals and I never felt comfortable. So, you know, from when I was about four or five, um, my dad might film us playing in the garden, like running through the hose with a water sprinkler on. And you could sort of see that I was naked, but I had my private parts sort of hidden. I tucked them between my legs and... I feel from back then, you know, now it makes sense to me, but looking back at photos and videos now, that sort of behaviour makes sense. I was so embarrassed and obviously my other brothers were completely unbothered. They, you know, they're proper men, I felt, but, you know, I, I felt really sort of like I had to hide. Wow, I mean, yeah, that's a lot of exposure, isn't it? You know, having that people look at you and 
yeah, I mean, I felt completely uncomfortable. It was really difficult for me. Okay, so, like, moving on from that, how do you know through those steps? Did you have somebody guide you through? How do you know what to do first or that the first process is to remove your genitals and then get your hair done? Is there a right process or is there anything out there, you know, that might help people through that sort of process? Yes, I mean, coming out to your family and friends and feeling safe, that is completely important. That's vital, really. It's so empowering. And obviously, if you don't feel safe, then that's oh, it's so difficult. And I think there's a lot of deaf people out there experiencing domestic abuse as well. So obviously, coming out in that situation is very, very difficult. So you have to feel safe. You have to be in a safe place. And, you know, coming out in your home could be risky if you think your family might react badly. So if you're out in a public place and you feel you can come out safely, it means there's other people around who can support with that. And then, you know, having your name changed and taking the hormones and obviously making sure that you've taken your blood tests as well as having the operation. And then, of course, um, I decided to have my chest done and my hair and my lips. But obviously, it's completely up to each individual about how they choose to go through that process. Brilliant. So it looks like we've got another caller. Hello, how are you? Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I mean, I'd like to ask a question um, to Samantha. So f from a man to a woman, or from a being a woman to being a man, do you think there's one that's harder than the other from transitioning from male to female or from transitioning female to male? Wh which one do you think's you know, is there a higher percentage of one to the other or what do you think is more difficult? That's a really good question, actually. I mean, I think both are equally as difficult because from a female to a male, you need two procedures. So you have to go through two surgeries, not just one. And I think more females transition to male possibly so for example you know having your um, genitals stitched up and removing your breasts that's quite a lot of um, operations but from male to female that's one operation one surgery that's it And what about with the treatment, the hormones? Is is that the same process for each or? Yes, I mean, for trans women, which is male to female, you have to take the hormones and you take them for life. That's it. There's, you know, never ending. You just take them for the rest of your life. Whereas from male to female have a different hormone. So that's called testosterone. And you have injections um, in your buttocks and that goes through your um, system and it seems to you know help grow your facial hair and things like that but I think that's sort of continuous well I'd just like to respond to that as well so f from becoming female to m male you still have to take your hormones for r for life is that right yes yeah, so I yeah I think you have to take them for life so if you're female to male if you stop taking them it might reverse the process I think so yeah I think you have to take them for life both ways. Oh, brilliant. So just my last question. If you'd taken those tablets for life, um, is there like a risk of anything if you're taking those? Of like to your liver and things like that? No, I mean, that's why the doctors are really concise about it. You know, they're making sure that when you're taking the hormones, they're taking your bloods, checking your hearts, things like blood clots. You know, ultimately, the hormones can be dangerous. So that's why it's always best to go through you, the GP because they can support you in the correct way and do all the appropriate checks, which is obviously very important. Oh, thank you so much for answering that. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And I'd just like to add to that point as well, actually. With the NHS, 
guidelines, they've got, um, are people allowed to change at a specific age or if they're younger, is it like a less risk than if they're older? Is that a thing? Yeah, I mean, in England, you have to consent. So you have an age of consent. Um, so I think younger people are blocked at the moment. So there's a bit of an argument which is ongoing. That's an ongoing issue in the community at the moment. But yeah, I mean, because obviously when you're a child, you can't have the hormone blocker. So they don't believe that children should have it. It's quite risky. So that blocker, you know, I think you suppose you have to consider don't you the risk of having the blocker or the risk of suicide from the mental health effects so i mean during puberty is is that when it would affect it is it before puberty or after puberty i mean i think i remember back at 14 i was very very late to hit puberty and i'm sure you've all heard about the sort of the male phrase your testicles dropping and my father always joke to me and he said oh yours won't they won't drop and I thought oh god why would they say that you know and I just I wanted to be a woman I didn't want to go through that sort of puberty and but you know and he was right um but I also I, I wouldn't allow my voice to get lower you know during puberty I was really worried about that because I wanted to be a woman wow I guess that was you know that sort of female identity inside you right yeah, and I mean, at medical appointments, my mum and my dad came with me for the blood test. And I remember a really funny story, I'll tell you. Um, we got to London and when we went in for the appointment, the doctor said to me, oh, why, why are you transitioning? Um, you know, to become a man. And I remember thinking really, you know, confused and worried. And my dad... Um, was interpreting for me because there wasn't an interpreter and he sort of said why are you transitioning to become a man and I was so confused and I sat there just attached to the chair and I said sorry what's the question and he said you know I'm asking why are you transitioning to be a man and I said no, no I'm here I'm a man now and I want to become a woman and the doctor just went red and at that time I thought I felt really insulting I thought he was teasing me but it was it was really serious and I just, I didn't trust him at all. But of course it was awful because there was no interpreter at that appointment. So my dad had to interpret for me. <laughs> your father was interpreting. That's brilliant. So your dad actually asked you why you wanted to become a man. So then I was really worried. I thought, well, who's asking me that? Is it my dad or is it the doctor? And I become like really stressed. It wound me up, to be honest. It annoyed me. But obviously looking back, I can laugh about it now. Oh, that is funny. I mean, looking back, obviously, it reminds me of a a deaf comedy sketch where they sort of were gossiping and chatting. And they told a very similar story about their mum in an appointment. Yes, and I felt the exact same way with my dad. I was so, I was so concerned and confused. But, you know, we, we then went through all the blood tests and I explained, I'll explain to the audience, it's very sort of difficult you know, instead of doing one to ten, we'll do sort of one to five, and then five to ten. Okay, so if, you know, the scale was one to ten, for the results, we had to have between five to ten, means that you could transition to be a man, but I was at 4.5, so I was nearly there, but, I mean, inside, I just felt, you know, I, I wasn't hairy. I, my brothers were really big, beefy, tall. I wasn't like that. Obviously, their balls had dropped and their speech was deep. But it just, it, again, it just didn't match me. I was so different. So that must be why. That must have been a real relief for you, mustn't it? You know, for you to be able to answer that, to get the answer that you wanted. Yes, it was almost like the penny dropped then. It was like, actually... Looking back on it and looking back at the videos, I was Samantha already and making those connections um, with, with my parents in the room 
you know, I can understand, they could then understand why I was going through X, Y, and Z as well. That's so lovely of you to share that, that experience with your parents, that they went through the journey with you as well. I'd imagine there's some people out there who are trans who don't have the parental support that you had, and I can't imagine how hard that must be for them. Well, I, that's why I wanted to write a book, to tell those people, you're not alone. We're here. We, as a community, are going to support you, and we're there for you. The trans community is so small and close because the number is so small, even especially as, as deaf trans. And you've got your hearing trans community where the suicide rate is ridiculous, it's so high. So what is it gonna be like in the deaf community when the mental health struggles are double because we've got all the barriers against us? So I think it would be nice if, if we could, we really do support each other. It's like a rich community and we go through the journey together. You've got that Facebook group, haven't you, that goes to deaf people, trans people around the world. Do you know what the suicide rates are? Have there been anybody in the group? Well, we've had, since 2014, we've had suicides two or three times, which has been really, really sad. Oh gosh, that's horrible. Really horrible. When they passed away, I felt like, you know, I wish that person could have contacted me you know what I mean? I feel like there is the support out there. If I could have signposted them to the right people, I'm not a counsellor, but I could have signposted them to the right people. And yeah, there are, like I said at the start, no deaf trans counsellors. So I imagine it must be ever so frustrating because they can't have the understanding, they can't have the empathy, they can't understand the process. If we had, there are hearing trans counsellors out there, but none for deaf. Yeah, it would fill that gap, wouldn't it? And I'm sorry to hear, first of all, that, that people have passed away. That's an awful experience. I'm trying to think of, of myself when there was a terrible situation and, and I just sat and listen to the person who was going through what they were going through and that talking through their issue is is you know really good you know like you did in the book you got to share your emotions and your experiences yeah and i want that person to feel the connection to who i am know that they're not the only one you know we all have our own struggles so there are similarities to everyone there really I know myself, I've seen, um, not deaf people, but you know, people when they're socialising, they, they, they are abusing trans people. And I'm gobsmacked that it still happens to this day. It's 2021. You know, wake up, hello. Well, I don't want to give too much away about the book, but I do talk about politics briefly. So I, I can share that a little bit, I think because it's interesting to have the viewpoint of um, we've got RNID, we've got Sign Health, and those organisations are not forward-thinking enough. I'm thinking of the hearing organisations who are a lot more forward-thinking. We've got, you know, ones for LGBT plus community, but it's the, the government's policies that are reviewing them um, and bringing them into the workplaces um, and organisations are, are looking at them and accepting them and saying yes we must follow them because they are our uh, protective characteristics but um, then they're not following the example that they've set so that's what I talk about a little bit it's not just in the British government is it I've seen it all over the, the news that uh, people are seeing trans as not a, a recognised uh, identity and we really really we need to just uh, give people more knowledge we need to let people know that, that you know we're out there because they just don't understand I think the last most powerful thing that I could say to people um, their third gender is out there because you've got male female 
and then you've got someone who is non-identifying as, as a gender, non-binary. And that, you know, this was 4,000 years ago that this was recognised. So what's the issue with it now? If it was recognised 4,000 years ago, why is it still a problem? And, yeah, it's because of the social um, aspects and politics. It's, you know, we think there's barriers with interpreters, but now we've got barriers to our own identity. People just need to wake up. So politics aside, what other things could you sneak in and tell us about? Well, there's another part in the book that talks about my parents and other parents and how they can support their trans child with coming out. So parents rejecting their trans children really, well, if I can give an example, what I've written in the book is that parents, uh, when they have a, a party, it, they have a coming out party, which I just think is such a lovely idea. And some parents, not all parents, they say, oh, wow, we've got a boy. Uh, you know, like a gender reveal party, you know, they um, they were real reveal whether they've got a boy or a girl, but actually it shouldn't matter whether the cake is blue or pink. It's actually about the child and who they are and who they grow up to be. I never expect, you know, that that sort of uh, picket fence image of, you know, boy meets girl, they get a beautiful cottage. You know, it's not like that. That's not how it should be. Let them grow and nurture them and love them and then let them fly. And then when they get come back home, you know, if they're ill, you nurture them back to health again. You shouldn't have your expectations forced upon, you know, my boy's going to get married to a girl. You know, I've got a boy, therefore he should have a wife. We need to remove that expectation, that stigma. I remember you spoke about spoke about your two brothers and the, the pressure that you felt there and the, and the assumption because your brother was gay that therefore it was going to be extra difficult for your parents. Yes, because my brother came out when he was 18 and then uh, left for Manchester in 2008. So... Um, think he w sorry so I, I came out at 18 and my brother was about 15 16 when he came out and I'm so jealous of the the, um, the defiance within him I think I would have probably come out at about 15 16 but because my brother was already out I felt that I had to hold on to that for another few years until I'd finally moved to Manchester Just to let you know, you can still come in live if you want to. Oh, well, we've got 10 minutes left anyway, so if anybody does want to come in, you're going to have to be quick. What else was I going to say? Let's talk about it. So, your mother and father, obviously you've spoken about that. What about the other extended family members? how did they react were they shocked or you know that sort of wider family or did they just get on with it yeah I mean I told my mum and my dad and obviously my mum and my dad were quite worried about what to say to my family as well and I think obviously their initial reaction my obviously my parents were very worried but you know I was quite a rebel as a child at that time so I said I don't care what the other extended family feel like I really I don't care you know my mum said no Samantha you know you can't say that you need to think about the family as well and the impact on them but that time I was thinking well no actually I need to think for myself I need to think about my mental health my well-being so I think maybe I should have maybe put some consideration to my extended family but really at that time I just didn't care I just needed to be me and myself and I didn't want to sort of come out and be worse off that, you know, I was working in the mental health sector and I was seeing all these incredible deaf stories and their different organisations and groups that were supporting. And I remember sort of sitting, maybe somebody who sat at the end of the bench at the end of a work day with lots of people going through, um, sort of checking on things. And somebody sort of checked in that they were 
depressed that something was wrong in their life. And I asked them what was going on and I thought, well, if I don't come out, I'm going to end up like that. You know, I'll end up in a psychiatric unit myself. I, I could not cope if I couldn't come out. Do you know what I mean? I just thought at that that was the time when it really hit me. You know, I need to do something about my life. I need to do something. That was really important. Wow. So obviously that's, you know, that's really important. You know, your body first and then, you know, sort of talk to the family and go through that process and don't really think about the extended responses just sort of thinking of yourself yeah I mean when I went to Manchester I was 14 stone I went to Manchester and I just felt like that was when I finally came out you know I wasn't talking to answering to my family I wasn't you know sort of worrying about those things and I managed to lose a lot of weight I think you know I was seven or eight stone and I became really really thin almost became anorexic as well you know I was so thin and it was because I wasn't happy because I couldn't come out around my family and when I went home to my mum and my dad they were so shocked because I was so skinny and you know my belt was coming out over here after I did it up my waist was tiny I was you know so thin but I said no no it's nothing it's nothing I'm fine but I could see you know my mum was feeling something and I was very worried about my voice breaking I said no no no, I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine but my mum could definitely tell that something was wrong and obviously losing all of that weight that really shifted um that sort of feeling in me that I really wasn't well I needed to change something so yeah I've changed for the better well just a massive congratulations I think your story has been amazing I mean I'm sure everybody watching agrees as well it's been absolutely incredible and obviously if anybody's watching hopefully there's some of you out there who maybe you've got some uncertainties and hopefully Samantha's been a brilliant guide and support for you today and so you know I don't think there's any more questions coming in I'll just check no there's no more but again just a huge huge thank you for coming today we, it's you know I've really enjoyed it today and obviously I've not seen you for a long time about four years now is that right yeah three or four years no it must be it was six years oh wow I mean that time's gone so quickly but thank you so much for coming Samantha I've really enjoyed it so sadly that's the end of tonight's show but we will have more and more events coming up with Real Lives Live so thank you so much for watching and have a lovely evening. Take care.